Well, good morning. Welcome to ABC. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you know, we're in a series through the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And uh, man, we just keep talking about bread all the time, it seems like. Um, last week, Tom talked about the feeding of the 4,000. Before that, Jake was talking something about Whole30. And uh, this morning, as I'm kind of looking at the passage, um, it's, it's about bread. And I thought, you know, I, I can't make it through another sermon uh, about bread without having some bread. I'm just going to get too hungry. And so I brought some bread. Oh my gosh, you guys, it's still a little bit warm. Um, this is super good. I wish I had some for you. Um, but mm, it's really, like, really soft still. Super good. Okay, so we're talking about bread. Jesus is really all about bread. He loves bread, and he breaks bread, and he multiplies bread. This morning, you know, we're looking at a passage where he talks about leaven, but we're going we're gonna to look at the bread together. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to snack a little bit because it's just too good. So it's like fluffy and warm. And Caleb heated it up for me in the cafe. You guys come get some later. But I'll just, yeah, we'll, we'll break it maybe and see how far it goes. Um, so we're talking about bread, and, and I started thinking about what makes this bread so good. And I started researching it a little bit. This is made by the Wonder Bread Company. There's a reason they call it Wonder Bread, right? There's no list of ingredients, but there is yeast, and this bread. Here's the thing that's funny about yeast I found out. <clears throat> Just let me choke for a second. Um, the thing about yeast is when there's flour and there's water and they combine and they start to activate the enzymes, it creates two different types of sugar. One, one of them is called an ethyl alcohol sugar. And when you add yeast to that type of sugar, it creates this reaction where if it's this nice, spongy, delicious soft, glutinous, not gluttonous, glutinous, um, stretchy bread substance. If it's elastic enough, what happens is those, those yeast activations form these little tiny air bubbles, these little pockets, and they kind of inflate the dough like a, like a balloon, and it makes it warm and delicious and airy and fluffy and perfect, and that's why they call it wonder bread, because it's just wonderful when you sink your teeth into it. If you're gluten intolerant, I'm really sorry, but it's just delicious, and so the yeast actually creates this amazing, soft, beautiful, delicious substance called bread. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus says this morning, watch out, beware of the leaven, or the yeast. And I'm thinking, come on, Jesus, have you tasted this bread? It's like the best. I'm not going to take the yeast out of it, and then it's like a tortilla, because that's not bread. That's just flat. You know the unleavened thing? We're going to talk about that a little later. But Jesus says, beware of the yeast, and I'm thinking he hasn't tasted it. And then I started wondering if those 4,000 people were fed with actual bread or if it was unleavened bread, and I got a little concerned for them. But he says, beware. If you go through the New Testament— Leaven or yeast, which is the leavening agent, if you will, is con continually referred to as this sort of uh, weeding in of pride and hypocrisy and arrogance. That every time we see leaven referred to, it has something to do with our heart becoming contaminated. And so when Jesus says, beware, watch out for the leaven— He's really talking about the hearts of the Pharisees because it starts to weed its way in and, and contaminate everything that it touches. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, that it contaminates the whole dough? And then he goes on and he compares that to the unleavened bread of sincerity and of truth. Paul's making this comparison that Jesus is drawing for us this morning, too, that there's a lack of sincerity, a lack of truth in leaven, that it's simply hot air, which tastes really good. It's just hot air. It's like blowing smoke. It's hollow. It's empty. There really isn't much substance to it. There's no nutrition in it. There's no life. And so he says, beware, watch out. Let me, let me back up and, and give you a little insight into what we're talking about here. We're in Mark chapter 8, and let's read the passage. You can kind of start to make sense of why we have bread this morning. If you're still wondering. We'll figure it out. Turn with me to Mark chapter 8. If, if you don't have a Bible, um, we're going to just put it up on the screen. You can follow along there as I read. Mark chapter 8, verse, four, uh, verse 11. 
It says, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. Come back to that. And said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Verse 14, Now they had forgotten to bring bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, this is his disciples now, he cautioned them saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls did I have of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Let me— Put the pieces together for you here in just a second. See what Jesus is really getting at with his disciples. So what took place last week, if you joined us and heard Pastor Tom's message on feeding of the 4,000 and then he, he, healing of this deaf man, is they're on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And it says that he took up the five loaves and he broke the bread and he fed 4,000 people on this shore of the Sea of Galilee. Then they get into the boat. They make their way back over across. They head west and get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, back where the Pharisees were kind of waiting for him. And so they pull the boat into shore. And there's a possibility that the disciples at that point had these seven basketfuls of bread that they were offloading from the boat. Because they likely would have given those baskets to the poor. And so imagine them coming into shore, docking the boat, starting to unload baskets of bread, and then the the Pharisees engage Jesus and they say, Give us a sign from heaven. Prove to us that you really are God. Imagine for just a minute Jesus glancing over the shoulder of those Pharisees, watching his disciples offload baskets of bread in which he just fed 4,000 people out of thin air. And he says, I'm not going to get a sign. The signs are all around you. You've seen it all. Look at the miracles that I've performed. Look at the things that I've said that, that have changed your way of thinking. Look at all of the things that I've done right in front of you, and you've missed it all. And in fact, he's watching these basketful, quite likely basketfuls of bread, get unloaded from this boat and, and realizing that in, right in front of their eyes is a sign. And he says, you're not going to get a sign. So he sighs in frustration. These guys are going to miss it. They're never going to. Get a sign. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. It's representative of the death, the burial for three days, and then the resurrection. But he says, that sign even you'll miss. This generation will not get a sign. You won't see it. You're going to miss it. And so, Jesus leaves the Pharisees, frustrated, gets back into the boat with his disciples. They start paddling offshore, And then this squabbling takes place amongst his disciples. I imagine in that moment, Jesus is sort of distant. His heart is still heavy with the Pharisees. He's still a little frustrated, a little discouraged. He's still sighing in his mind, staring off into the horizon. And he calls out to his disciples, watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They're like, what? Where's that coming from? Leaven. And they go, oh, it's because we forgot the bread. And, and he's like, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So I want to just unpack that for just a minute. As Jesus makes a very clear point, as he's just left the presence of these blind and frustrating Pharisees to make a point to his disciples because he's concerned that what was taking place in their hearts might also take place in the hearts of his disciples. And so he says, watch out, you guys. Beware. Don't let the leaven infiltrate your heart. And so I want to look at this leaven of pride this morning. 
at the pride that has infiltrated, has contaminated the hearts of the Pharisees, and, and that Jesus is now concerned for his disciples of the same. And, and in line, we're, we're the next. And so we're, we're just as susceptible of this leaven of pride. And the first thing is that this pride is hollow. It's just like this fluffy, delicious, warm bread. I'm not going to try to eat anymore. I won't be able to talk. It's hollow. There's nothing there of substance. In fact, pride puffs up like hot air, doesn't it? And, and the interesting thing about leaven, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that it leavens the whole lump, that it starts to breed, that it contaminates everything it touches, and so does pride as you and I interact with one another. If, if I puff up, if I ante up in a sense, if I start being arrogant in your presence, or I, I start to uh, make some bold statements, then your human, maybe your fleshly reaction is going to be the same. You're going to be like, oh yeah? Well, let's go. You want to go? My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad's stronger than you. My dad could beat up your dad, right? It's what we do. We puff up, and we get to this point where we're battling with ego, because if you puff up, I'm going to puff up right back at you. You know who the worst is? Jeff Erke behind the driving uh, steering wheel of a car. And my wife will tell you. <laughs> Seriously, I, she says, I don't know what it is. Uh, it, maybe it's like the false sense of protection from the glass and the doors or the fact that people can't hear you, but you're like the worst. <laughs> something, something happens when you get behind the drivers. And it is, and I don't know, I'm not proud of it, but you guys, I'm that guy that when uh, someone comes up behind me, okay, so and maybe this has been you, and if, if it has been you, I'm not that sorry because you shouldn't have done it. But I'll drive, you know, maybe like 70 miles an hour in the left lane. I know that's a little bit over the speed limit, but let's say there was an emergency. Maybe I'd be driving 70 in the left lane. And somebody comes up behind me going like 90 miles an hour and they come as fast as they can and they get as close as they possibly can to my bumper. Have you ever had someone do that to you? And then what they do if you don't even allude to the fact that you might move, then, or if, they, if you don't look in the rear view mirror, they think maybe this person hasn't seen me. They'll flash their lights. Oh, it's on now. <laughs> you flash your light. Okay, 55. I'm slowing down. You stay right there. I'm not moving for you. And I'm going to make a point. I ante up, right? It's that pride. And so then they scream by me, and I'm like, hey, how's it going? Good day, you know? I am not the happiest driver in the world. And I'll start calling people by their vehicle names, like, you stinking Camry. Like, how do you learn how to drive? Take your license away. You know, just get really upset. And, and the, the driving uh, piece gets the worst out of me every single time. And it's like this swelling of pride and ego that when I'm in the presence of pride and ego just gets worse. It's part of our human nature. It's just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, bad company ruins good morals. Spend some time with some arrogant and prideful people. It starts to rub off for some reason. Leaven makes the bread hard. Look at verse 16. It says, And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to him, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And this is a critical line a really important statement that Jesus asks of his disciples because he knows what's taking place in their hearts. He knows what's taking place in their mind and the discussion that they're having amongst themselves. They immediately think that Jesus' comment about the yeast must somehow be related to the fact that they didn't plan well, that they don't have any bread, and they start to argue and bicker with one another and go, it's because you who was supposed to? We had like seven baskets. Where's all the bread? We only have one loaf left. Who was some, Matthew, you were supposed to bring the bread. I was supposed to bring bread. You know, they're arguing with each other about the bread. And he says, wait a minute. Are, are your hearts getting hardened? Because so quickly they forgot that, I mean, maybe it was even the same day, the day before he had broke those seven loaves and fed 4,000 people. Have you so quickly forgotten? Don't you remember? I provide the bread. You need not worry. And they have this spiritual amnesia that we all suffer from, and it's dangerous because we forget so quickly the provision of God. We so quickly forget the promises of God. We let our eyes grow blind and our ears grow deaf to what he's speaking to us, to the hope that we have in him, to the faithfulness that he's 
led us with before. I think of Israel when they were led out of Egypt, the oppression, the injustice, the slavery that they were under in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 16, it says that the Israelites grumbled against Moses, and they said, we wish we would have just died in Egypt. Come on! You were being whipped and treated as slaves? You hated that place. There was an evil dictator, and all you wanted to do was for God to hear you and to set you free, and so he did, and you got out of Egypt, and now you're out in the desert, and God's provided a way for you to get there. He built walls of water in the Red Sea so you could cross it, and then you got to the point where you were hungry, so he dropped bread from heaven, and then you wanted meat instead of bread, so he sent ravens into camp so you could eat meat, and now you're going to grumble and say, I wish we would have just died in Egypt. Come on! How quickly our hearts get hardened and we forget the promise and the provision of God. This leaven hardens. I, I was reading Numbers. Um, this last couple weeks I've been kind of working my way through and you get to Numbers chapter 13 where Israel sends the spies in. They get up right on the edge, kind of the border of the promised land, the place that God had said, I'm going to give you your own land so you can start your own nation and be your own people. And he gets right up to the edge of, of uh, the promised land. And so Israel sends in 12 spies. And they come back, and 10 out of the 12 are like, no, nah, too hard. Those guys are so big. And their cities have, like, big walls. There's no way. We can't take them. Nope. And Joshua and Caleb, the other two guys, are like, come on. Did you guys forget who we're serving? Did you forget what he did for us? Did you forget how we got here? You don't think God could take care of us? Could get us into the promised land? They're like, nope. In fact, Numbers 14, this is crazy, you guys. They actually rally together in search of a leader to take them back to Egypt. If Moses won't take us, we'll find someone who will. Let's go back to Egypt. Serious? Come on. We forget the promises of God so, so quickly. Finally, we see that this leaven fears, this pride fears before it trusts. Look at verse 16 with me again. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. I want to focus in on this line for just a second here. Just imagine the scene again. Disciples in the boat, just having left where Jesus was engaging with the Pharisees, having come back across from the Decapolis where he fed 4,000 people, they're sitting in the boat with Jesus, 13 guys in the boat, theoretically, and they begin discussing, we only have one loaf of bread? What are we going to do? What? And Jesus is shocked by this. He's like, wait a minute. You guys, do you not know who I am? Did you not see what I did? Do you not think I could take care of this so easily? They began discussing the fact that they had no bread. It's in our pride that we're prone to suspicion. We're prone to worry. We're prone to be anxious. We're prone to fear more than to trust. Why? Because our pride says, I should have figured it out. I'm smart. I'm capable. I'm a planner. I'm gifted. I'm strong. I can get enough bread. I could, could have provided for myself. I could have brought food if I had known he wasn't going to. It's in our pride. If I don't do it, no one else will. How many times you guys said that? I say it a lot. I'm trying to say it less. We just sang this song uh, as Jake was leading us in worship. Powerful song. Jesus paid it all. There's a line in there that, that I, I, as I was singing just struck me. Lord, now indeed I find my power in thine alone. I find my strength in you alone is what that song said. And I'm singing that and thinking, nope. No, I don't. Because I'm strong and capable and educated and I can plan and I can outthink it and I can prepare and I can make sure that I don't get to a point where I only have one loaf of bread. I can keep some margin. I can keep an emergency fund. I can manage relationships in a way that will allow me to keep at this nominal level so that I don't end up in an emergency. I can plan ahead, and my pride says, I got this. And Jesus says, no, you don't. You don't have this. I have this. 
And it's in our pride that we get to this point where fear and worry and forgetfulness start to grow like leaven, like yeast. And it permeates every single aspect of our life. It's not just in one area, because what happens is it multiplies. And worry begets worry. And anxiety grows anxiety, which breeds fear instead of trust. And so that forgetfulness will continue to grow and grow and grow until, just as Jesus said, our hearts become hardened. And so he says, don't be like the Pharisees, you guys, please. Don't let it grow. Watch out for the leaven. Watch out for the pride. It'll get you off course. It'll blind you. It'll keep you from seeing my provision. Is it possible? Just think about this for a minute. Is it possible that the things that worry you the most, the things that you're most anxious about or things that you lie awake at night thinking about, is it possible that those things are a result of pride? Think about it, because we wouldn't normally make the connection. We would say, oh no, it's insecurity because I worry that I'm not good enough or I worry that I'm not going to be okay or I worry that I'm not going to have the relationships that I hope for or whatever those things might be. But really, isn't it a result of pride that says, no, I should or could or can, therefore I worry. Is it possible that the things that worry you the most, the greatest fears that you have are a result of pride, of a hardening that says, I should be able to take care of this. I can. I'm strong enough. I'm wise enough. I'm resourceful enough. I'm an American, for crying out loud. I can do it. Just gotta work a little harder. Put a little bit of elbow grease into it, right? I got this. Jesus says, are your hearts hardened? See, the amazing thing with Jesus in this moment is he he needs to remind them everyone eats with Jesus. No one goes hungry. You don't need to worry. You don't need to fear. And he says, how quickly have you forgotten? I mean, how how long ago was it, 24, 30, maybe 40 hours ago that he fed 4,000 people that were with him for three days and they were hungry and so he fed them. Everyone eats with Jesus. You need not worry and in our pride as that leaven starts to ooze its way into our heart and bleed its way through our soul, we begin to worry and we begin to become anxious as long as we're worried about producing and creating and sustaining ourselves. We'll miss the provision that's right in front of us. Let's keep reading. There's another um, piece of scripture I want to look at as we close this morning. Verse 22 says, They came to Bethsaida. So this is after they get out of the boat again. They took their trip across. Apparently they were fine. They didn't need to eat. Or one bread became 20. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they, they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, Do not even enter the village. Now, this is a really interesting turn of events. If you look at the passage in context, we just saw Jesus feed 4,000 people, then he healed a deaf man, as Pastor Tom shared last week. Then they get into the boat. He starts talking about leaven. We're worried about pride. We're worried about forgetfulness. We're concerned about, you know, our hearts becoming hardened, and then they get out of the boat, and Jesus goes and heals this blind man. And I ask, why is this piece of scripture tucked right here in the middle of this teaching on leaven and pride? Well, it's interesting that Jesus performs this miracle in two phases, isn't it? That he first touches his eyes, and the guy can see, but he can't see real clearly. In fact, he says, I see men, but they look like trees. It's fuzzy. Jesus says, okay, let me touch you a second time, and then he opens his eyes, and it's clear. Could it be possible that Jesus is alluding to the clarity that will come as our hearts become soft, as our eyes and our ears become open to see what God is doing, that the leaven of pride will harden, but the love of Jesus will soften. The provision of God will make things clear for us, and that in that moment it wasn't clear for his disciples, but it was going to come clear really quickly. 
Isn't it interesting that he both heals a deaf man and heals a blind man? And this passage about the leaven is sandwiched right in the middle. And here's what he says. You might have missed this when I read it earlier. Verse 18, he says to his disciples, Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Isn't it interesting that Jesus is concerned about their hearts and he's concerned about them hearing and seeing and believing that Jesus is enough, that his provision's going to be enough, and yet there's leaven, there's fear, and there's pride working its way into their hearts. And he says, have you not seen like that blind man? But look, I made him see. Have you not heard like that deaf man? But look, I made him hear. I'm going to solve all these problems. Just relax, rest. Listen, learn, take heart. I'm working, I'm doing it. But beware, you guys. Watch out for the pride and the leaven of the Pharisees and that of Herod, because it will take you off course. You know what's also interesting about pride is that it kind of produces uh, a little bit of Jealousy, doesn't it? I think about the way that Jesus touched these men, and Tom did such a fantastic job of talking about the physical touch. And if you weren't here last week, go back and listen to that message. But the fact that Jesus touched this deaf man and that he touched this blind man in such an intimate way, I imagine in that moment, think about a leader that you followed, maybe even a parent. And how you desperately long for their attention and their touch. And then think about these 12 disciples watching this intimate interaction take place between Jesus and a deaf man, Jesus and a blind man. And he touches them with such intimacy. I imagine there would be some jealousy from those guys going, well, he didn't touch me like that. He never took me outside the city one-on-one and touched me, paid attention to me, cared for me. Because pride will grow in our hearts that jealousy, that longing for attention, and Jesus saying, you're right here with me. Beware. I'm going to provide. You're going to see. You're going to hear. Don't worry. You see, our pride leads to worry, but our prayer can lead to humility. Here's the, the really challenging thing about pride. It's, it's virtually impossible to self-diagnose pride. You can't stare at yourself in the mirror for long enough to see the areas in which you struggle with pride. There are some things that you could probably self-evaluate and go, yeah, I think maybe I'm being a little bit arrogant or a little bit prideful. But for the most part, it's really, really challenging for you to self-diagnose, for us to be able to think long enough, reflect for long enough, to, to even sit and meditate on our own character and our own position and posture before God and before others and go, oh yeah, that's an area that I'm really struggling with pride. No, it's called a blind spot because you're blind to it. And so what we need is for truth-telling people in our lives to be able to say, you know what? I think there's a little bit of leaven there and you need to watch out for it because it'll grow in your heart and it'll take over eventually. And it may be exhibiting itself right now in worry or fear, anxiety, or it may be exhibiting itself in, in poor driving habits, but either way, it's there. There's pride. There's arrogance that's growing in your heart, and you need to watch out for it. And so I want to just ask you to consider this. Would you find an honest, trustworthy person that could tell you the truth? Maybe it's a spouse or a sibling Maybe it's a parent, a loved one, an accountability person, someone in your Bible study, that you could come and say, I really, I really don't want leaven to breed in my heart. I really don't want pride to grow and to take foot in my heart. Is there a way, is there an area that you see in my behavior, a way I'm acting that's prideful or arrogant? To just consider that this morning. We're going to take communion in a few minutes. Before we do, I want to invite the, the band to come back out. And we're going to sing uh, a song. And, and what my hope is, is that we s- sit in the boat with Jesus in, in a figurative way that for just a few minutes, as, as Jake and the band are singing this song, that we could sit there in the boat for a minute and hear Jesus shout that 
phrase of caution. Beware, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And for us to sit just for long enough to be able to say, God, could you show me? Because the other way besides having a person in your life to determine some of those prideful areas is to simply ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it. It says in the Psalms that if search my heart and see if there be any offensive way in me that God will do that for us. And so during this song, my, my hope is that you would have the freedom just to pray and, and maybe not sing if that's what you need to do or maybe sing and just say, you know, I need to align my heart. I need to be in step with the Spirit. But just to pray and say, God, would you reveal that to me? Would you show me what it is that, that's prideful or arrogant or self-sufficient or worry or anxious in my heart? And ask for him to reveal it in these moments ahead. talking about leaven today and that we're having communion which is unleavened bread and so begs the question where did the unleavened bread come from where's that idea from and uh you know what's what's interesting is God's real strategic and and he sort of knows our our heart and he knows the wanderings you know that we we end up leaning towards and so uh, what he did for Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt, is he said, I want to set you free. I want you to completely be liberated from the oppression of this dictator. I want you to be able to run and and be free and have your own land, your own place. And so he said, I'm going to set you free, but we're going to do it in, in haste. So he said, keep the belt around your waist and the sandals on your feet, because when it happens, it's going to happen like this. And then he sends what we call the Passover 
night and there's an angel of death that takes the firstborn of every son in Egypt or every family in Egypt yet passes over the families of Israel and in that moment they arise, they get up in the morning to flee and Egypt says go, get out of here and so Jesus or God says don't Don't wait for your bread to rise. In fact, make unleavened bread. There's no time for that because you're going to leave in a hurry. And so they make unleavened bread and they eat their bread on the way out as they leave Egypt. And then several thousand years later, when Jesus circles back at this habit that's now been created for Israel to remember again, they take seven day period to remember every year that God freed them from the oppression of Egypt. That God set them free from the ruler, the Pharaoh. They gave him a new a new place to call home. And so he says, remember for seven days, purge your home of all the leaven so that you could remember what I did that day in Egypt. And then Jesus gathers up his disciples during this seven day period where Israel's remembering the faithfulness of God and he passes out this unleavened bread and he says, I want you to remember that with haste, I will go to the cross and I will set you free from the oppression I will set you free from fear, from anxiety, from a hopeless future. And with haste, Jesus went to the cross. And so we have this unleavened bread to remember that God did it for us. And we will never forget because he knew we'd be forgetful. He knew we'd be prone to worry. And so we take communion this morning and we take this unleavened bread. Sorry, you don't have the soft, fluffy stuff. But it's on purpose. It's so that we remember God's provision. We take this bread together. And then Jesus passed around this cup and said, this this is the, the blood that was shed for you to cover over your sins, to cover over any root of pride or sin that would grow in your heart has been atoned for and covered. And so we take this cup together. God, we, we are so forgetful and it's easy for us to look at these disciples in the boat and, and sort of mock them and how could they forget the feeding of the 4,000 and be worried about some bread? And yet you knew that they were just as prone to forget as the Pharisees were prone to forget the faithfulness and the provision of Yahweh. And you also know that this morning the first day of September in Atascadero, that this church, this family of believers is prone to forget. That, Lord, we will be quick to worry, quick to become self-sufficient, self-sustaining, and think that we've got things figured out. And so this morning, God, you pass out this bread to us, I think, strategically to remind us, God, that you took care of it, that everyone eats with Jesus. And there's nothing we could do to make up for it. There's nothing we could do to provide. There's nothing we could do to outthink our need, but to trust. And so, Lord, I ask this morning for that trust. Trust in the one that followed through, that did what he said he would do, and that gave us a new hope and a new future and a new life in him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And well, can we stand together? Just sing this again. Together, think on the, the work that Christ has done. Think on the power that he has. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind but now I see hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave hallelujah yes yes Christ is risen from the grave the prodigal's welcome home Prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now is saved. For the God who died came back to life, and 
And everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, no death. No death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. process through these things together. And the reason we're all here in this room together is because we know that we can't learn and grow and worship and, and read and process through this life alone. We're here because we're a family. We're here because God designed it this way. This is his church. And so I just want to encourage you as, as you leave today, we're going to have a prayer team up front here. Um, there's some people that maybe you even came to church with, or maybe you've seen someone across the aisle that you haven't connected with in a while, and you think, you know, I need I need to connect with that person. And, and in fact, I'm going to sit with somebody, and maybe you've already thought of that person that you're going to sit with and, and just ask, can you help me ensure that there's not a root of pride or leaven growing in my heart? We've got to do it together, you guys. We can't do it alone. We can't stand and stare long enough in the mirror to grow. It won't work. And so let's just do that together as we go this morning. Thank you for coming this morning. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday for Back to Church Sunday.